Ooh, that looks tasty. Welcome, folks. Stay the Hunger Gamer is back, and today I have with me Jamie Stegmeyer of Stonemeyer Games. For the three of you who don't know who he is, he is the designer of Scythe, Viticulture, Tapestry, and my personal favorite of the catalog, Euphoria, among others. And he also runs the day-to-day -day operations at Stonemeyer Games. The website doesn't give an official title, so the man, I think, is what it officially is. <laughs> and uh, recently, Stonemeyer had their runaway hit with Wingspan, which won, I don't know if technically this is right, but I believe all the awards, I think, is uh, <laughs> uh, the technical term for it. And they have a new one, Pendulum, dropping in just a couple weeks. And finally, if the headshot you see on the screen can be trusted, he's super friendly. We'll see. <laughs> uh, so, uh, again, thank you for uh, joining me for just a few minutes. So, you uh, you started your publishing life, as it were, on Kickstarter, like everybody. And uh, raised about $3 million, somewhere around there. But the past couple of years... You've gone away from Kickstarter, which is not what a lot of, uh, well, big big companies are doing. And, yeah. um, you know, I know in theory, Kickstarter is about small indie companies getting their project off the ground. But in reality, it's kind of become a place for the big companies to throw their new thing out. And it's even gone the other way to where I have seen people say, oh, gosh, they've never done anything before. I'm not going to back them which is uh, antithetical yeah. to what Kickstarter used to be. So uh, the first question I have for you is, um, what are your thoughts on Kickstarter, what it was when you were using it, what it is now, and are you ever tempted to say, oh, I'll just put this one on Kickstarter? That's, I, I really like the way you put that. I, I hadn't actually heard that perspective before, even though I can totally see it, the idea of, uh, of, of new creators um, almost not being looked down upon, but having some doubts some maybe some trust issues where, where backers look at that. And definitely back in the day when I was getting started on Kickstarter back in 2012, 2013 was Euphoria, uh, 2014 was Tuscany. Um, that was, it, it was certainly nice to have a project or two under your belt, but I didn't sense those trust, trust issues for the initial project. I wonder if people have been burned a little bit over the years, maybe one, maybe everybody has like one notable project where they just never received it, or they had a few where the communication wasn't good, or they didn't receive the the project uh, or the product, the reward in a long, for a long time. Um, but that, yeah, that's a great example of something that that may have changed over time, because now, especially like if you look at the vid the original Viticulture project, I don't know if you ever looked at the Viticulture, the 2012 Viticulture Kickstarter campaign was a lot less polished than any project that you see, any successful project that you see on Kickstarter today. There's a huge difference in the amount of uh, art and graphic design that I think you're expected to put in before you launch uh, compared to eight years ago. What have you noticed? Have you noticed any any big differences? How long have you followed Kickstarter projects? As oh, probably. You know, I did my first one on Kickstarter. It wasn't a board game. I don't know, seven, eight years ago or something like that because I knew someone who wrote a book and they okay. had it on Kickstarter. And then I didn't think about it. And uh, I mentioned to you briefly before we started, I also run a theater company. And then a friend is a Shakespeare company and a friend of mine said, hey, there's a board game on this comic about killing Shakespeare. Let's do it. And so that was the first board game I got on Kickstarter. And that, you know, it was fun. <laughs> it was a fun thing to get into. And then I actually talked to the company yeah. and they actually sent a copy of it. We gave it away at one of our shows and it was oh, cool. awesome all around. Um, and then I kind of went away from it again until I really got into board games a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, Ironically, not for me. I started doing this for my brother, who's trying to design a game. And he said, "Hey, you you speak well. Would you make a how to play video for me?" I said, "Sure. No one's going to watch it, you know." So <laughs> I board game geek and wrote a review. Uh, and then I wrote another one. And then someone said, "Hey, if I send you this thing, would you write about it?" Uh, sure. Uh -huh. And then someone yep. else said, "If I send you this thing, would you make a video?" Sure. <laughs> and now, um, and now you're stuck talking to me. Well, we were all <laughs> by your cat in the background who is very clean right now. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, so that's kind of where, where I was. But now as I've become friends with some uh, you know smaller designers, that's kind of what they've been uh, talking about. So, you know, it's really hard. People are like, oh, it's too expensive. And so what this is less than, you know, a Simon game or, you know, I only say Simon not because I have anything against them because they are Kickstarter, you know, like. Yeah. Yeah. They are all Kickstarter. 
And um, I've started to hear from smaller designers when I do previews that they're having hard times because people say, well, you've never done anything before. Why should I back you? And yeah. uh, so uh, it, it's a weird, it's that weird catch 22. And so obviously that's not what it was when you started. Uh, but yeah. are you ever tempted to go back? I, every now and then. Yeah, a, a little bit. Because it, 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 like you said, you, you, the, the Killing Shakespeare uh, campaign that you were involved with as a backer, it, it, it can be a lot of fun. Like there's a lot of excitement condensed into a very short period of time. Um, it can be very invigorating as a uh, as a creator to see people supporting something that doesn't exist yet. Like that's the biggest difference between what we do now. Now we, at my company, we make a product and then I announce it almost Kickstarter style where I reveal things day to day, kind of like stretch goals. Um, but we've already made the product at, at that point. So I, it's still, there's a lot of excitement and I, I enjoy being a part of that excitement, but it is different to have to, that shared passion before you've even made it. Cause you're like, wow, all these people are are excited about this thing that I haven't even made yet. I do miss that. I miss the thrill of that, but there's a lot of other parts that I don't miss. And there's a lot of good stuff in Kickstarter that I found that I can do outside of Kickstarter. I don't need Kickstarter to gauge demand. I don't need Kickstarter to, to build a community. Um, those are things that help me grow my company, but I don't really need those that I, I need those things, but I don't need them from Kickstarter anymore. And so uh, I was kind of ripping off of that. Um, whenever you go to any of the, uh, Facebook board game groups about doing Kickstarters. You yeah. can't go nine comments without someone saying, go look at Jamie's post on Kickstarter. So in some ways you, you are the guy that everyone says, oh, go look at what Jamie did. Yet what Jamie did was stop using Kickstarter <laughs> right. as he became able to do that. And yeah. well, what is that balance like of, now, you know, if I see, we look at Pendulum right behind you, you have already put the money out for that. What is it? What is that kind of uh, stress like? Whereas with Kickstarter, well, I'm going to print as many as I can based on what I get coming in. But now you're having to make the prediction, like with uh, uh, well, Wingspan exploded and you know, reprint, reprint, reprint. So, what is that balance like of balancing out how much money do I put out? How much do I print? Ah, uh, what if people don't like it as much? Or hopefully, like Wingspan, everyone loves it. So what what's that balance like? Because that's something that most creators don't have with Kickstarter. Well, there's two sides of it. One is the the side of gauging demand and, and uncertainty there. And I found even with Scythe, Scythe was our biggest Kickstarter campaign, did very well. We had, I think, there were around 18,000 backers and uh, many ordered more than one copy. So I think we had around 20 and 21,000 Kickstarter copies to send to to backers. But even then, knowing that number, I still had the uncertainty of how many retail copies do I make? How many copies do I make for distribu distribution? That was still a complete guessing game. Um, and so no matter even if you use Kickstarter or not, I think that's still a big guessing game. And so I do other things now to gauge demand rather than going to 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 customers or people to ask for a loan eight months in advance, like like Kickstarter creators are essentially doing. I I go to retailers and distributors and I say, how many do you think you might want of this game? And that helps me through that process. The other part that you mentioned is uh, the idea of fronting money. Um, and and that, that's another big side of risk. For Pendulum, we fronted everything. We, we, we paid for a print run of the game, not knowing that we'll sell a single copy. I think we will sell a single copy, but I don't know that. That's uncertain. At least three. And, I've seen at, at least, least three, three people say that they're all right. So <laughs> you're okay. That's a strong start. Yeah, it's a good good day one. Um, but yeah, that, that's a big uncertainty. And, and that's one of the reasons that I, I get why other companies continue to use Kickstarter, because if people are willing to give them that money eight to 12 months in advance of them actually sending the game, and both parties feel good about that exchange, great. I mean, it, it, if, if, if they need that and that can mitigate that risk, uh, that that's a that's a big deal, but Stillmeyer Games is at a place as, at a, as a company where we we can front that risk. The only downside there is if we don't make enough copies, actually, or if we make too many copies, it can go either way. But uh, yeah, really, really, either either way there is is uh, is tough. But no matter what the circumstance, even with Kickstarter, I think the point is that you, it is almost impossible to exactly predict demand when you are starting the production of a game, which is usually five to six months before, at best, before it'll hit retail. I, I want to pivot a, a little bit. And um, yeah, yeah. you know this pivot's coming because you've seen the notes. Uh, yeah. But 
the I want to pivot a little bit into uh, uh, social justice and uh, uh, social rights within the gaming community. And yeah. the horrific murder of George Floyd sparked protests, obviously, all across the country, across the world. And the board game industry has not been left out. Uh, uh, tons of companies, outlets have made statements confirming Black Lives Matter. Others have been conspicuous in their silence and in many cases have taken a lot of backlash for it and vice versa. Uh, now, you put out what I think was an incredibly powerful statement, and I'm putting it up on the screen for everybody to read. Uh, and what was important to me, my takeaway was, it's not just saying, we at Stonemaier believe Black Lives Matter and this is horrible, so on, but you've pledged to put your money where your mouth is. And can you speak a little bit about why you decided to take that step and then projecting forward, what, what is your hope with the industry moving forward in regards to inclusivity and social justice and so on? Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that, uh, well, it was, it was part of a process to be honest. Like the, there, there was George Floyd's terrible murder and how it came out for us, for the world to see. And then, as you said, the, the, the protests came pretty soon after that. I don't think they were immediate, but it, maybe about a week later they started. And, um, and we started to see some very powerful statements in the board game community. And, we talked about it a lot in, internally at Stonemaier Games. So there, there are two full-time employees at Stonemaier Games, me and, and Joe, our director of communications, and then we have some shareholders that we talk about this type of stuff with. And uh, I won't go into the whole process, but basically we, we had to learn from each other a lot during that process, and we brought in other perspectives too uh, to get a more uh, diverse set of opinions. And in, in the end, we realized uh, that we didn't just want to make a statement to stand with uh, the uh, Black Lives Matter and, and, and Black, Indigenous, and people of color, but that we wanted to, um, in this moment of time, but we also wanted to make an ongoing difference, an ongoing positive change, if we could have such an impact. Uh, and that was where the declaration of, of action came in. That's kind of what we called it. It's not just a statement. It's a declaration of action with quantifiable measures in, I think, seven or eight different categories that we want to achieve this year and hopefully on a yearly basis. Like this is This is a long-term project for us to lift up others in the industry who maybe haven't had a voice or haven't had uh, as big of a voice as they as they deserve, just like anyone deserves a voice in this industry. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's our goal. That's our drive. And um, you also asked about the industry as a whole, how it might impact the entire industry, the entire community. And that I, I, I don't know exactly. I, I'm hoping that this is for, for other companies too. I hope this is more than just a moment and, and more of a, uh, a long-term lifting up of people. Um, both lifting up of BIPOC people, lifting up of people and companies that are willing to make a difference. And honestly, from my perspective, not, not uh, focusing on putting down those that aren't doing something or, or doing something differently than what I'm doing. I can focus on my positive change, but I'd, rather, I'd much rather focus on what I can do, what I have control over, um, than, to, uh, to, than to derail or denigrate uh, other people who maybe are doing things differently. Yeah. Um, uh, what are your thoughts about it? Yeah, from your perspective as a, you know, as a content um, creator. When, I mean, this is not the for, for people who aren't in America, this is not yeah. the first time that there have been protests and uh, uh, around Black Lives Matter. This is perhaps the first time that everyone's finally getting, well, not everyone, but mid lots of people are really getting on board. And it was clearly the video of that that murder. I mean, clearly, yeah. um, even though Eric Garner had videos and, and so on. But it's interesting to me that now it's like we had to happen enough to where everyone got it. And yeah. what really, you know, and at uh, Hungry Gamer and Geek HQ, we, we made a statement as well. And we've actually pulled out of dealings with some other groups that have refused to make statements. Mm -hmm. And it's almost to me been the people who are refusing to acknowledge that this is a thing. And it's not uh, my it's a question that I, that I added last minute mm -hmm. is, you know, what is your reaction to people who complain, who complain, don't bring politics into my games, you're ruining it. And of course, uh, yeah, the argument of, you know, but is it politics? You know, is it politics or is it a right to live, a right to be equal? And I've always loved games because 
it's a safe space to go play and make believe and get away from the problems of your life. And, you know, if you have them, but perhaps our community hasn't been that. And so uh, for me, that's all kind of where it wraps into my head, which is why I yeah. wanted to ask you the question because you're putting your money at where your mouth is and that's action. Right. And that is action and using your privilege when the industry and you know socioeconomically or whatever it may be to do that and that's exciting to me and uh, i think more people with power need to go down that direction and again in whatever the way they do it doesn't have to be you know i'm going to give a scholarship or whatever right. but you know seeking out designers and content creators and even if it's just you know uh here's a new content creator i'm going to send them a copy of pendulum right uh, because the more voices we have, the safer a space it is. So that, that's, that's, that's kind of where I, I land on it. Um, and it helps that my work with theater is specifically around different perspectives in the traditional white male perspective, which is theater. I mean, you know, uh-huh. who's the most famous playwright? Shakespeare. White, straight man, you know. Yeah. You, you, you rattle them off, that's who you're going to get. Though I will say... Yeah. The most published, uh, produced playwright in the world, at least before all this, is a uh, American woman, uh, Lauren Gunderson. Who oh, okay. she's after Shakespeare. She's the most produced living playwright. But oh. that aside, and so our whole theater company, our goal is uh, bringing theater to the stage from different perspectives. It's called Perspective Theater Company, specifically to do that. Whether that is the stories of uh, women who stayed in Kuwait during the invasion. We did a whole play around that. Our play that we're supposed to do is written by a, a Latinx playwright about what happens if the world goes through a disease and the whole world's changed. I ask you not. We, that was before all this happened. We picked that really? play. Wow. Now we can't do it because we can't do the play. But, you know, this yeah. is from this other perspective, this uh, uh, minority woman perspective. And so that's kind of what we do. So yeah. I'm all for it. That was a really long answer. And you became the interviewee, but interviewer. But you know, I just think it needs it needs to be out there, and we need to talk about it. Yeah. And you yeah. know, that's what we're doing at the moment, and that's what your st- plan, action plan did, and made people talk about it. Um, and before we move on to to the fun pendulum, uh, well, we all hope fun, right? Um, <laughs> What, what what do you what is your response to that statement that people have? Don't bring politics into my games. Like, how do you? What is your reaction to it? Well, I, I in this specific instance, for sure, I completely agree with you that this is not a political issue. I uh, I think some people have politicized it, but I don't think I think uh, human rights and human equality uh, is 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 not political at all. I, 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 I'm baffled that there's even a debate that um, that it should be an issue. So that, that that is that is baffling to me. In terms of the general idea of bringing bringing or not bringing politics into the gaming industry, um, I don't know. I, I, I like I, I I guess I respect uh, creators of any type, publishers, content creators like you. Um, who who decide simply who, who say they're in, in the U.S. if they're a Democrat or Republican that they don't integrate that and in, could review it from the perspective of a, of a Republican or a Democrat. But I don't know if that I, I guess I see that as a personal choice in that way and in, in the true like politici- politicization of it. But for this this issue in particular and many issues that are dealing with um, human equality, quality of life, things like that um, that I don't see as political issues anyway. I think it's good for people, especially in pe- people in power and authority and privilege, um, to speak up and act and make a positive difference, um, and not ag- not ignore it. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, yeah. And yeah, that, that was kind of a might have been a softball question, but you know, just uh, it's I think it needs to be, you know be, be talked about because there is yeah. a lot of well fear. I mean, there's a lot of fear about everything right now. And so, you know, I talked about a minute ago, you know, the idea that it's a safe space for everyone to be and have fun. And that initial impulse, oh, you're, you're bringing something that I'm afraid of into my safe place, you know? So it's very yeah. visceral. 
and more visceral when you're behind keyboards, you know. That's true, yeah. And I, and I, I certainly appreciate that. I mean, with, uh, with some experiences that I've had throughout this process of, of, um, of uh, throughout this entire process re really recently, I, I've, I've experienced a little bit of that myself where I, I, I um, there was an instance where I, I asked a question and, uh, and the response was rough. It was someone basically saying, don't ask this question, don't ask it, do the work yourself, do the research. And I get that now. I, I get that maybe I shouldn't have asked that question, but I w it would have been great to have it to have both, to have a safe space to ask that question and the healthy challenge to go elsewhere and do the research. I think we can have both of those things. Um, and so I'm, I love that you brought this up it, as a conversation piece for us to discuss. I, I, I hope there's a lot more of this too. Yeah, thank you. I, well, me too. Um, yeah. But I know we're on a short time and yeah. everybody's either looking at the cat or pendulum over your two shoulders, right? Yeah. yeah. So, um, new game coming, I guess, three weeks or so you can pre-order. That sounds about right. Early August, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, Pendulum. Now, a couple of videos have dropped with some of the gameplay. Now, initially, when I heard about this, I heard real-time worker placement. I immediately thought dexterity game, and I had mm. images of flipping meeples across the table, landing them in little cups or something. Uh -huh. And fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your perspective, you can have that idea if you want it, by the way. Um, <laughs> that is not what this game is. Um, right. Just quickly, what is it? What, why real-time worker placement? Like, wh what's going on? Well, the way I phrase it, it is certainly, it does have, it has sand timers, there is a real-time element. The way I phrase it is that it's a turnless, simultaneous action game. So like most worker placement games, you have a turn, and on that turn, you are placing one or more workers. In Pendulum, you're doing that at the same time as other workers. Where the time element comes in is very similar to Tzolkin. Have you played Tzolkin? Uh, just, just like once, very few times. Okay. So it's in many ways a time optimization game. In Sulkin, you are placing workers on, a, on, a, on these gears, and the longer you leave the worker on that gear, the better the benefit they get. It simulates time. The worker is spending more time doing something, so they're getting a better benefit. In Pendulum, it's the same thing. You're placing workers on an action, and there are a few actions that have a very short timer, a 45-second timer associated with it. And the benefit you get from that worker being stuck on that action for 45 seconds is okay, it's it's fine. But if you put a worker on a two minute action or a three minute action, they're stuck there for a lot more. You can't be using that worker in the meantime, but that worker is going to produce a much more, a much better, much more powerful benefit. So you're constantly kind of gauging this process of how, how do I wanna use my workers to optimize the amount of time that I have each round? And, and the real time element is, where am I going to place the workers while other players are, are trying to do the same thing? It isn't, it's surprisingly not frantic or stressful during those times because everyone has their own little rhythm of when they're picking up or placing down workers when they're moving around those workers. Because um, in many real-time games, I end up feeling stressed. That isn't how I feel when I play Pendulum. So you, you hear that, folks. Everyone who is looking at the game and seeing four sand timers that are all three, being... Three sand timers. Oh, excuse yeah. me. Only three. Yeah. Never mind. <laughs> three sand timers that are simultaneously being flipped and constantly flipping throughout the game. You heard it here. It's not hectic. <laughs> um, part, of, part of it, what helps is that players can flip them whenever the sand runs out. Any player can flip it or not flip it. So if you need to take a break in the game or you just need a little extra, few extra seconds to think, you don't have to flip it. Or if you kind of want to pin down another player, you could flip it quickly. Usually players are flipping it pretty quickly because they want to activate their, their other worker associated with that timer. Yeah. And, and so when, when the game first was, was pitched to you, now, because in the yeah. game there is a real-time option and a just turn-based, it's got a little uh, me meeple hourglass that goes down and tells you yeah. what you use. Was it real time or turn based when it first was pitched to you? And whichever one it was, whose idea was it to put the other mode in, and how important was that? It, it was it was real time and turnless uh, when it was submitted to us. Um, but throughout, we actually found something interesting. I haven't really talked about this much, but um, early on in the design process, when when the designer was working on it, um, he was either playtesting by himself a little bit, but also locally with friends. And so he was always teaching the game and the games ran pretty smoothly when he was teaching it as can happen when the designer is there. But once we started blind playtesting it, we realized that it's, it, it was 
a lot harder for players to learn that first play in real time than when you have the designer there teaching the game. And so we implemented a few different solutions. Part of it is just streamlining play and Im improving the, the user interface and things like that. But the other it was to add the, 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 the option where you don't use the timers for either a, one of the four rounds, two of the four rounds, or the entire first game. So that way you can get into the flow of the game, you can understand how all the actions work without that added pressure of, of the, the timers ticking down. And so um, this game was discovered at the Stonemeyer Design Day. Now, the, mm -hmm. I'd never heard of, the, heard of this before, so I suspect a lot of people hadn't either. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? And then how do people become involved? Someone's like, oh my gosh, I have you know, the next pendulum. Yeah. Come on, Jamie, give me a shot. You know, How do they get that shot? Well. Uh, the, the the core idea of design, I think we've had six or seven in the, at this point, is that it is an opportunity for designers in St. Louis and around the country to come to St. Louis on a single day and spend all day playtesting either their game or and or other people's games. So there are a lot of people that attend who aren't designers. They're just there to playtest and have fun. Um, there are other events like this under different names around the country. There's one called Unpub that I think is fairly well known. It's similar to that, with the only difference being with the Summer Games Design Day, we also intentionally have a few time slots where we play published games. So that we're not just playing uh, uh, prototypes, but also learning from published games and kind of learning together with each other. Um, we play at a, we host this at a, a game cafe in St. Louis called Pieces, an awesome game cafe if you ever come to St. Louis. And they have a capacity of about 100 people. So every year, it's uh, I, I first invite the people who have attended in the past, and then there's usually around 20 or 30 slots left over. And I send out an invitation to our general e-newsletter for people to sign up for those slots. And um, so, and how did Pendulum come from that? Like, how yeah. did it just get you know noticed to literally behind your right shoulder? Well, it got noticed initially because that one of the traditions at Design Day is that I ask all the people there. Um, most of whom are there just to really have fun. Maybe, maybe they're playtesting a game, maybe they're playtesting, but they're, they're not a fun. They're, there's not really like a secret motive by Stonemaier Games. But every once in a while, because I am there, because I'm hosting it, I noticed a game. I noticed a game that, I, that I'm really interested in. And one of the games that ga one of the ways that games catch my eye is that people rate the games that they play. And Pendulum received the the highest rating ever for a game at Design Day. It was an average of a 9.3 rating. And so even though at design day, I saw it and I was, I actually, I saw that it was real time and I was kind of like, yeah, you know, real time always stresses me out. So I, I won't really look at that. But then I saw the rating and I was like, okay, I'm missing something here. I need to check this out. So that's how I first noticed it. And that was th almost three years ago. So that once we eventually signed it, uh, I went through a pretty significant development and blind play testing process to bring it to, to what it is today. And so the, uh, the way your website compares it to seven wonders and soul can you've mentioned now yeah. on the game shelf of the universe, I would put those pretty far apart, you know, not the farthest apart, but pretty far apart. And, yeah. you know, so obviously Pendulum somewhere in the middle there. What's right next to Pendulum on that shelf if you're organizing it by type and style, you know, you go to the library. Oh, I like this. Look. Oh, here's one right next to it. I like that, too. What do you put next to Pendulum? I would put Sulkin much closer to it. I, I use the example of Seven Wonders because um, I think most people associate that with the drafting, but I think a core element of Seven Wonders is the simultaneous play. It's not like I'm picking a card and then someone else, turn by turn, the game would take forever if you did that. So that simultaneous play is pretty crucial to Seven Wonders. But in terms of uh, weight and engine building and worker placement and the time optimization, Sulkin is very similar to it. It's maybe a, a little heavier than Pendulum, but very close to it. Um, all right, so my, my, my last two questions is we're coming up on, on the time here. Now, there's one rule. You cannot pick a game that you've worked on, designed, or anybody sure. from Stonemeyer has had anything cool. significant to do with. Okay, so yeah. no, for, no free, uh, free, free, free pub on this one. Okay. Um, you, you're getting a COVID is cured. Game night tonight. What's hitting your table? What's hitting my table? Well, actually, I am hosting game night tomorrow virtually on Board Game Arena, and I'm going to learn and play Rallyman GT. Um, so that's a, a real answer that will that will happen tomorrow. I really will. That's good. That's that fun. Tomorrow. I'm supposed to play that on uh, Board Game Arena. Uh, Mike from One Stop Co-op Shops is raving about it. He wants to teach me that oh, yeah. tomorrow. Also, that's very funny. Um, oh, really? Yeah. And nice. uh, what uh, you got to just if you have to pick one, what's your favorite game? The last time I made a list, I do I do my top 10 list twice a year. And the last time I did it, I put Clank at number one. 
Um, I love Clank in general. It's sometimes been on my top 10 list, sometimes not, but I just finished Clank Legacy and I just I had such so much fun playing Clank Legacy that I that I I couldn't not put it at number one. So until I make my new list, Clank Legacy is at number one. Have you played Clank or Clank Legacy? Uh, I have Clank in Space, which Clank Space. I, I, okay. I've enjoyed a lot. And Clank Legacy is one that I keep saying, oh, I want to play that. But I can play it with my wife and me. Yeah. So someday, Clank and Legacy. Someday. Though I am starting a game tonight of uh, The King's Dilemma, all mm. virtual. Oh, really? Buddy got, and then uh, the same buddy who's begging me, begging me to ask you a question. Um, yeah. Got it right before lockdown, the physical version. Uh, we yeah. got six lists together, and then, but we found a way that you can do it on tabletop simulators. So we're starting oh, yeah. that. So we're doing that one tonight, but that's the, it will be the first legacy game I get to actually play with a big group. And so I'm excited. Cool. So if it goes well, Clank Legacy is going to be on my, my list to say, okay, we, we, we did that. We all ripped each other apart in King's Dilemma. Now let's, <laughs> I guess, let a dragon rip us apart. But uh, uh, did you have uh, three minutes to answer two grab bag questions? Yeah, especially the one from your friend. Yeah, what, what's your, your uh, so, side loving uh, friend? Was... Yeah, so uh, his, his, his favorite game is Scythe, unabashedly. Mm -hmm. And I've played more Scythe Digital than anything else since uh, lockdown started because everyone else is like, hey, hey, you want to you play a game? Sure, what do you want to play? Scythe. Okay. Um, <laughs> so his, he wants to know when can we get the airships? Inside Digital and or Rise of Fenris. If 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 I had my way, it would be I would magically snap my fingers and they would be there right now, including side encounters and the module of the board as well. But um, it is really in the hands of of Asmo Day Digital and the Knights of Unity. And so, from what I know, I, I, from what I've heard from them, that really the next step is to get side on iOS in the U.S. Um, I thought it was actually already there, but it was only in the U.K. and I think maybe Canada. Um, so that's the next step. And then after that, they're going to look at, I think, adding the airships next. I've almost advocated for them to do the encounters next, or maybe the modular board, because I thought that would be faster for them to implement. Um, but they'll, they'll choose one of those things and, and implement it next. So, so I appreciate the, his, his enthusiasm for it and his patience. It's future. Yeah. Future. They, the very solid data. Future. Um, yeah. and then did that just kind of launched my other real quick question on, uh, what, uh, what prompts you to allow certain games to have digital implementations and, and how does that affect the sales of the actual game? Well, I, so it's been something that I've kind of, I've fully embraced over the last couple of years. I was a little, a little hesitant for a while, largely because there was often, for the companies doing it, they required a pretty significant investment up front, and I didn't know if there would be the payoff on the back end. But that formula has changed a little bit over time uh, in terms of uh, most of the companies that we license our games to, we pay a little bit or nothing and they, they get a, most of the back end revenue, we just gain a little bit. And the thing I love about that is we get a little bit of cash flow without really having to do much. And it's a wonderful place for people to learn how to play our games if the tutorial is done well. And if people are learning our games, then they probably are getting the, the real version if they have it to the table more often, or they might be more open to buying the tabletop version, or they're just having friends with fun with their friends worldwide, especially in times like these where we can't meet with our friends. So I've really come around to it. I love the idea. I would love for all of our games to be, be available in digital format um, in full AI and on places like Board Game Arena. Most of them are on Tabletopia and Tabletop Simulator already. Yeah. Um, so that that's it for me. Um, any thoughts you want to leave the thousands or maybe dozens of people who are watching this? Well, I, I'd love to end with a little question from for a game behind you. I, I'm actually doing, so I, you know, I do a YouTube channel where I do like top 10 lists and things like that. And I'm doing my favorite pirate game, like literally in 10 minutes, I'm doing my fa top 10 favorite pirate themed games. <laughs> and you have Dead Men Tell No Tales up there, which I haven't played. Do you think I should hold off on making my list until I get the chance to play that? Ooh. Well, it depends on what else is on your list. It is... Uh, uh, it's one of those games where you are, you know, running around putting out all the fires while you're trying yeah. to do something else, and it does that really well. I, I will say okay. that it, it is more. I mean, you are actually literally putting out fires and then uh -huh. fighting ghost pirates, like you do, you know. Yeah, right. Called, yeah. We call that we call that Thursday in California. <laughs> but it is it it is a good one, and it's it's a good solo co op game. The uh, I have the uh, so somewhere I have the uh, Kraken expansion, which really makes it 
a lot better. Suddenly, not only are you putting out fires and ghost pies, but there's also the Kraken. You know. Yeah, you can't beat a Kraken. Yeah. But, well, you know, that's the thing. You have to beat the Kraken to win. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but so, so it's, it's all of that. It's, I would have it in my top 10 pirate games. Um, mm. But I don't know that I could name 15 pirate games. I had to struggle a little bit to come up with a list. And there's some that I just haven't played, like Roman <laughs> Bones I haven't played, a few other ones I haven't played. And actually, it's behind, actually behind Tapestry. I have another one that my mother gave me when I was in middle school called Privateer, which oh, okay. you might not be able to find, not even find it. And that was actually a pretty good little roll and move. Uh, you get to pick your country or the pirates and go to the middle of the board okay. with the pirate treasure and steal it from other people. Um, okay. But, you know, I don't... Perfect. I love pirates. Don't have a have a lot of them. It's apparently very hard yeah. to make a good pirate game. But there are a lot of them. I mean, like on Kickstarter, there are like a half a dozen pirate games at least this year so far. That was what yeah. brought yeah. it to my well, attention. Right. I got one I'm reviewing right back there too. Uh, called uh, 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 oh my gosh, called um, Merchant's Code. Oh no, that's a great. If you've never, if you haven't played that worker placement game, it's it, well, it's not yeah. it's not out yet. That's the uh, uh, it's brilliant. I mean, it is. I backed it. Yeah, but I, yeah, that's awesome. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, going to doing a game with uh, two of the designers via Zoom because they want to test out some more stuff. And apparently I'm the only one with a copy still. They, they sent theirs to a publisher in China. Uh -huh. Now they don't have them. Like, can we Zoom and play? I was like, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, gosh, he's going to kill me if I don't see it and mention his game. Um, it was all sourced... Oh, I will put it into the thing on the screen when I put this up so okay. forever. But it was a um, all uh, ecologically created game. The board, there's almost no cardboard in it. Everything is wood and metal, and the board is canvas. And um, yeah, so I guess I have more pirate games than I really. Oh, here it is. Uh, sea shanties. Sea shanties. All right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so it's awesome. uh, so uh, a a a Andrew can forgive me because I haven't. It's three to five players. I haven't been able to do it since COVID. Uh -huh. But maybe yeah. a little publicity will make him forgive me for. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyhow, uh, cool. I really appreciate that at the time, and um, yeah, looking forward to seeing more about P Pendulum. I don't know if you saw Rado put out his final thoughts on Pendulum. Just kidding. Nothing here. <laughs> Click on my app. <laughs> yes. Um, but look, looking forward to it. I know there's a lot of people very excited about it. But yeah. um, again, uh, everybody, thank you so very much for watching and have a wonderful, wonderful day. And pre-order. <laughs>